deserving of our praise. He's deserving of the, the songs that we sing. In fact, one, one place in the Word of God, He said that the glory is due His name. Do His name. I preached on Friday night about, you know, we love God. We don't just serve Him out of obligation. But let me remind you, there still is an obligation. There still is glory that is due. His name. He's still the King of kings. The Lord of lords. Hallelujah. Let's give Him some of that praise here today. Let's give Him some of that glory that He's deserving. Hallelujah. You can be seated here tonight. Hallelujah. 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 Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh God, I praise you, Lord. Oh, Lord, hallelujah.
The Bible calls him the only wise God. Hallelujah. The only wise God. Of course, we know he is the only God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And, but when the scripture says he's the only wise God, that tells me even if there was another God, he'd be ignorant. And uh, because there's only one wise God. Hallelujah. And I'm glad that his sweet, sweet grace. And I don't know your backstory. I don't know what life you came from. And uh, But I'm sure that, that people in Germany or Cameroon are no different, or Denmark are no different than people in, in, uh, in America, no different than people all over the world. And uh, that even within this number that are here this morning, there are ex-alcoholics and ex-liars and ex-drug addicts yes, and ex-adulterers and yes. people of every walk of life. Yeah. And yet here we are washed and purified and cleansed and, and standing before God. Hallelujah. Not with our righteousness, but with the reflection yes. of His righteousness. Oh, thank you. Come on, sweet grace. Yeah. That's how we can sing amazing grace. That's why we can, we can sing about the goodness of God. It's because we've experienced it. We have a testimony, yes. as Pastor Sop said, yes. of what God can do and what He will do. Because the beauty about God is He stays the same. Amen. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That lets me know if He did it for me, He can do it for you. If He did it before, He can do it again. God do it again for somebody. Come on, you were the only hungry person in Germany. You were the only hungry person. You say, well, there's nobody else wants to be saved. Well, you wanted to be saved. You're here, and there's somebody else just like you. Just like you. God do it again. Let that amazing grace that, that changed my life, let it go change somebody else's life. Hallelujah. Bring revival. Revival to Wiesbaden, revival to Germany. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. While you're standing, if you would please turn with me to the book of Mark, uh, chapter number 10. I'm going to read a few verses here, beginning in verse 17. And the uh, Lord bless each and every one of you for being here. Hallelujah. What a beautiful, beautiful church. And what a lovely spirit of worship. And I love it. I tell you what, they need to put bongos in every apostolic church across the United States. There is something about it. And uh, I, it's, it's, in fact, I might just start playing the, the bongos. I'll leave my saxophone here and take those around with me. And I love it. I love it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love what we can feel here today. And just to be a part of God's kingdom, God's church. And of course, the church is more than just mortar and cement and lights and, and there's nothing that, that is about this building as a building that's any different than KFC, any different than Aldi or uh, any building across this, this country but when God's people have come together and the people that are called by His name, we are the church and so here we've come to church we've come to a place where we can be changed, we can be touched and I'm even going to preach about a change and uh, I, I did not see on Friday night that your, um, your screen up here, the welcome screen, and it says welcome home, and then it says where life change happens. And that is almost my title here this morning, and I'm going to preach on a life-changing experience. And life-changing experience. It seems like God has, has already begun a trend. And uh, from the very first words that, that were spoken by Pastor Sapia this morning, um, all the way up until now, and I believe God's going to help us today. The book of, of, of St. Mark, chapter 10, beginning in verse 17, it says, And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good Master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Of course, this is kind of a, what we would call in America a tongue-in-cheek statement. It's a, a slightly sarcastic statement given for the benefit of the Pharisees that were around him. 
And then to this man directly, he says, Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. Now I want us to take notice. We're going to read on here, and I know you're standing, but I'm standing too. So yes. you can stand an extra 30 seconds here today. What, what Jesus is inviting this young man to, to do. He's inviting him to discipleship. Yes. I don't know if you recognize it or not. He, he's telling him the same thing he told Peter and Andrew and Matthew. Go sell whatever you have. Drop the nets. Leave them where they are. Take up your cross and follow me. Jesus looked at him. It says he beheld him and loved him. He saw me and said, you know what? There's something here I can use. There's something here that I can... I, I, I'm, I'm going to invite him into my inner circle. I'm going to invite him to become a, a, a one, of, one of my disciples. One of my twelve, if you will. But this young man, look at his response. It says that he was sad at the saying. And went away grieved, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked round about and said unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answered again, he clarifies his statement, and said unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. Of God. Hallelujah. Lord, speak to us today. I believe through this word, through this, 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 this service today, you're going to speak to a heart, Jesus. Lord, minister to me. Speak to me. I pray to every man, woman, and child that is in this building that you would let your will be done. I want your will. I desire your will in my life here today. In the name of Jesus Christ. Everybody say in Jesus' name. Jesus. Let's clap our hands unto the Lord one more time here today. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. You could be seated here today. Hallelujah. You cannot argue with experience. Yes. You can't argue with a testimony. And uh, Pastor Sop mentioned a testimony just a few minutes ago, said that we are a church of testimony. And, uh, and it's, it's so important, of course, that we keep the testimony. Um, the Bible says that they overcame him, talking about um, the devil, the accuser. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They kept their testimony. And uh, you, you can't argue with a miracle. That's why we've got to see it. You know, you can argue with a statement. You can argue with, um, with, with, with a, 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 you know, if I brought just a, a bunch of words to you, if I brought a thesis to you, you can argue with that. You could, you could counter my points. That's why um, Paul said, I come not with enticing words of men's wisdom, but by a demonstration of the Spirit and the power. Why? Because you can't argue with a demonstration. You can't argue with, with an experience, a miracle. And in fact, one place the uh, um, there were some Pharisees that tried to do exactly that. And you read in the book of John chapter 9, where there's a, a man that was born uh, born blind, the Bible says. He was blind from his, from his birth. And uh, Jesus heals this man. And of course, it's on the Sabbath, so they've got to find something to, uh, uh, to, to jab at Jesus about, the Pharisees do. So... Um, as soon as Jesus leaves, they begin to, to tell everybody that would hear how Jesus is a sinner because he healed this man on the Sabbath. And they even go to that man. I mean, that's pretty bold. Here, this is a guy that, that Jesus just healed. And they immediately go to him and start, and start trying to convince him that Jesus sinned and that Jesus did wrong when he healed him. And of course, I love the man's response. You can read it for yourself on, on your own time. And But he says, you know what, whether he be a sinner or no, I, I, I don't know anything about that. He said, but one thing I do know, whereas I was blind, now I see. 
Hallelujah. He said, that's all I know. I, you know, you can argue all you want about, uh, about what should have been done or shouldn't have been done, but there was a miracle. There was something that happened in my life that you can't argue with. Yes. Amen. Right. That's why it is imperative, even as young people and, and these children, that it's imperative, it's so important that, that you uh, that you get an experience for yourself, that you get a testimony for yourself. Because if you've experienced it, if you've, if you've felt the Holy Ghost, if you've seen God work in your life, and you've seen uh, God, God transform things in your life, nobody can argue with you about that. Nobody, nobody can convince you otherwise. There's no, no debate. There's no argument that, that, that can rob your faith from you. Why? Because it's based on an experience. It's based on, on something that, that happened in your life that you witnessed. There's a testimony to support it. You have an experience with God. Hallelujah. In my mind, there is uh, nothing that is more fun, more enjoyable um, than what we did just a, a few minutes ago, than, than, than shouting and worshiping and, and dancing. I love it. Um, it's biblical. It's important that we um, that we do worship. The Bible instructs us to worship and instructs us to worship even uh, uh, with demonstration, with lifting of hands and, and singing and dancing and, and clapping. Uh, it's all it's all in the Bible. That's all important, and it's how we are instructed to praise God. And uh, I, I believe a lot of things can get accomplished in a good worship service. I, I believe that, uh, that that there are there are healings even that can be can be performed and things in, in our lives that can be uh, brought together while we worship. I believe that. I don't believe I, I need to qualify any further my stance on worship. And hopefully in these next few weeks that uh, um, you will be able to see our love for worship. However. And this is what I really want to um, to preach about today. However, what good? Tell me what good would even that experience? And I know that the purpose of worship isn't for us; it's for God. It's to God, and any blessing we get is just is just it's just run over. It's uh, it's residual from that 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 glory we're giving to God. But even that experience of a good shouting service, even that good experience of, of a good church service, if I will. Pastor said at the beginning, we don't want to just have another good church service. And, and, and what good would that do me in the long run if I was not changed by that experience? Yes. Come on, thank God for an experience. But I want an experience that changes me. I want, I want a life changing experience here today. Let me say it like this. I know a lot of people that can, that can worship. I know a lot of people that know how to worship, but they don't have victory. Come on, they, they know the words to all the songs. They know when to clap their hands. They know how to look and how to dress. But they don't have victory in their own life. I, yes, they have an experience with God. But Brother Patrick, it was not a life-changing experience. It was not an experience that changed who they were and what they were. Uh, this young man that we, uh, that we read about together just a few minutes ago in Mark chapter 10, he had an experience with God. In fact, it was it was a more um, intimate experience, I think, that any of us would ever have. He, I mean, he heard Jesus in the flesh. He he went up and, and felt of his hands, and and I mean, this is this is Jesus right in front. What an experience uh, that he had with Jesus. Uh, but the tragedy is, is that after that experience, uh, which after that first hand encounter, after hearing the words from Jesus' own mouth. Uh, we read where he left that experience the very same way that he came. Hallelujah. What a tragedy. What a tragedy. When such opportunity, when such potential was offered to him, when such a, 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 different, a different future was offered to him, and yet he left that day with the very same dreams and passions and vices and, and problems and sins and issues in his own life that he had when he very first came and heard from Jesus. Yes, he had an experience, but it was not a life-changing experience. Lord, I want to experience you today. I want to feel you today. I want to worship you today. But Lord, I want this to be a life 
changing experience. I don't want to leave here this morning the same way that I came. I don't want to leave here today with the same struggles and, and issues and thoughts that I had when I came here today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Perhaps this might seem a blanket statement, but friend, there are some things in our lives that we need God to change. I said we need God to change them. If you're perfect here and you know there's nothing that God needs to take care of, maybe you are in the wrong place. Maybe you need to be in heaven with the rest of the, the perfect people. But, but as long as you're here and as long as I'm here, I think that we're, we're all going to have things we need God to take care of. We're all going to have attitude issues and problems and, 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 and vices that, that we can't deal with on our own. We can't fix them on our own. We can't help them on our own. We can try and in fact, people do try to change themselves, but often it, it, it's ineffectual. It doesn't work, but we, we need God to change us. Come on, we need God to reach down and change us today. Hallelujah. I, my prayer this morning is, God, if there's anything foul, if there's anything impure, if there's anything unholy in my life, take it out. Take it out and change me. Change me. Hallelujah. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus returns to his hometown of Nazareth. Matthew 13, 57. It says, And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Can you imagine? There was only a few... Sick folk healed in Nazareth. Maybe somebody with a, with a flu, somebody with a cold. But there were no blind eyes open in Nazareth. There were no deaf ears open that, that were unstopped. There were no great life-changing miracles. There were no devils that were cast out. Nothing great. You hear Jesus. We're talking about the God of creation and flesh walked upon their streets. Jesus walked and kicked up the dust of the street, walked right by their house. And yet there was no life-changing events or life-changing miracles that took place. They had an experience with Jesus, but it was not a life-changing experience. It was not the experience that some other cities have, that some other regions have. Hallelujah. You say, well, we sure had good church last week, or, or I, I really felt God when I heard this. So I heard that, or however many years ago when, when I prayed through to the Holy Ghost and I had an experience with God. That's great. I thank God for that experience. I thank God for whatever experience you've had with God up to this point here today. But I, let me ask you this question. Did it change you? Did it change you? Did, did, did it change your dress? Did it change your conversation? Did it change who you are? Hallelujah. If it did not, thank God for that experience. But what you need this morning is a life-changing experience. What you need today is an experience that changes what you are. Not just what you do, but what you are. Hallelujah. That's possible. Yes. Did you know that? Let's, let's turn to the book of Acts chapter 9. I want us to read a few verses here. I, I will not have you stand because we're probably going to read a, a, a little bit more than I usually would in, uh, in, in preaching. But, but I want us to see the, the complete transformation here. In the book of Acts chapter 9, we read of a, a man named Saul of Tarsus. Saul, of course, was mentioned one other time up to this point in Scripture. And that was at the stoning, the execution of God's man, Stephen. And where he was just a young man holding the coats of those that, um, that had put to death God's minister, God's preacher. But here in Acts chapter 9, we find Saul again. It begins, and Saul, yet threatening, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord went unto the high priest. Saul breathing out threatenings and slaughter. 
Hallelujah. Look at what it says. He didn't just, just, you know, this wasn't something that he had to do. This wasn't anything that he wanted to do, that, that, that he didn't want to do and was being forced to do. But th this is who Saul was. It says he breathed out threatenings and slaughter. This was his character. This was his nature. He was a violent man. He, he, he was a, a ruthless man. And he might have been imprisoning the Christians and, and, and putting them to death under the guise of, of religiosity. And maybe he felt he was being religious in some respect. But, 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 but this was not something that he, he didn't like to do. He desired this. He wanted to go to Damascus and imprison and kill and, and maim and, and bring in all those innocents and put them to death. He desired. He breathed out threatenings and slaughter. It's important that we recognize how violent of a man this Saul was. It says in verse 2, And he desired of them letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, talking about Christians, whether they were men or women, that he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And it said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. He was blinded. And it says, And they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. Now once again, where are they at? Damascus. Where was Saul on his way? Damascus. This Ananias, this was the pastor of the very church that Saul was on his way to destroy. This is the, can you imagine that, 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 that turmoil that Ananias must have felt? In fact, we read into that, that questioning that he has with God when he first hears from the voice of God. But he's like, man, this Saul, he's come to destroy me. He's come to, uh, to imprison me. Can you imagine if, if Pastor Saul got word that, uh, you know, there was some, some um, tyrant general that was on his way to, to round all of you people up and, and put you to death. And then God comes to Brother Saul and says, I want you to go meet him and pray to him. And he'd be like, but God, I mean, he, he's coming to my people. Then this is my church we're talking about. But, but here Ananias in Damascus, he hears from God. And uh, in verse number 10, it says that he said to the Lord, and, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And I've seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. I like the order that God worked this out. He kind of put Ananias in a corner. He put him in a pickle. He said, Ananias, he's already seen in a vision. Somebody called Ananias going. So, you know, Ananias, well, I guess I have to go. He's already seen me coming. It says that, that he might receive the sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints in Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, now, first off, that's some faith right there. Hallelujah. He was speaking by faith. I mean, it, the first words he says, he doesn't know if, if Saul's got people in the back closet ready to arrest him or not. But he says, Brother Saul, hallelujah, God's going to work a miracle for you. I'm calling you brother already. I'm believing already that there's a change that's going to happen. I'm believing already that there's, a, that, that there's a miracle that's about to take place. He says, Brother Saul, the Lord 
even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell, as it were, uh, as it had been skipped from his eyes, as it had been scales, and he received his sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. Where? Damascus. The very same church that he was that he was going to imprison. The very same people that he was going to. to this was his home church. His home church was Damascus. The apostle Paul. This is where he received the Holy Ghost. It says he remained certain days. He was right there. Look, there's Brother Saul's seat. Right there behind Brother Patrick. He, he dwelled with him. In verse number 20 it says, And straightway or immediately he preached Christ in the synagogues. That he is the Son of God. He preached Christ. I want you to look 20 verses. Acts 9 and 1 to Acts 9 and 20. 20 verses we read. Just a few weeks transpired. But what a change. What a difference. What a difference was wrought in this man. From a man that breathed out threatenings and slaughter. A man unrecognizable. From that fatherly figure. That we read so so many of his letters about uh, about love and grace and mercy. That fatherly figure, the apostle Paul, who wrote to Timothy and, and to Titus, his sons of the gospel. And, and we look at that, and then we look back at the beginning where it says, "Breathing out threatenings and slaughter." That doesn't even sound like the same man. You know why? Because it wasn't the same man. <laughs> oh, it was the same body. It was the same person. But it was a different creature. The Bible said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Hallelujah. God, that's the kind of experience I want today. That's the kind of experience that you need today. I've had experiences with God, but here this morning, I want a life changing experience. Hallelujah. Change what I am. Change my thought processes. Change my character. Change my very nature. As you did for Saul. Hallelujah. What a change. What a change from imprisoning those who proclaim the name of Jesus. Murdering men, women, and children to preaching the gospel. That's the experience I want. That's the experience I want. Hallelujah. Let's clap our hands to the Lord here today. Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. In the book of Romans, we, we get a little glimpse into Paul's thought process during this time. He's writing, he says, I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law, to the law of sin which is in my members. Anybody here ever felt like that before? Another place in this passage he says, uh, that which I hate I do and that which I love I do not. In other words, I want to do right. I want to be right. I want to be what you want me to be, God, but there's part of me that, that's resisting. There's part of me that, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. And then we hear the desperation, the desperation of a repentant heart. As Paul begins to write in verse 24, he says, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Hallelujah. Oh, wretched man that I, I want to change. I don't want to be this man anymore. I don't want to be. I need deliverance here today. Hallelujah. That's the very same place each and every one of us need to come to. He was saying, God, I'm tired of 
being who I am. I'm tired of falling. I'm tired of failing. I'm tired of being touched and being touched by you, but not being changed by you. I'm tired of experiencing things and, and being around church, but not being changed yes. by these experiences. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to change. I want to change. I said, I want to change. I want to change. Hallelujah. Sister Clark, would you come to the piano here today? I want to be like that woman with the issue of blood who left healed after she touched the hem of his garment. I want to be like blind Bartimaeus of Jericho. I, I want to be like the man uh, with the legion of devils on the Isle of, of, Gess, uh, 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 of, of the Gadarenes. I, I want to be like uh, uh, I want to be like those that Jesus touched and healed, and, and, and the lame man at the pool of Bethesda, and, and the lepers that were outside the city gates. God, I want to change. Hallelujah. I, I want to change. I, I don't want to look the same way and act the same way and talk the same way. I don't want to live my way any longer. But I want to change. I want to change. Hallelujah. Did you know that's what repentance is? Yes. We believe that plan of salvation is right here on the wall. Repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, the washing away, passing over of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But the first step is repent. Repent. Let me tell you what repent is not. Repentance is not apologizing. Uh -huh. It's not apologizing. It's not just saying, God, I'm, I apologize. I, I'm sorry I did that. It's not repentance. Now, godly sorrow is a part of repentance, right? Yes. I, I've got to be sorry. I, in fact, I probably should tell God that I am sorry. But that in and of itself is not repentance. In fact, when you read that passage there, you pulled up the, the Greek, you would find that there's a word metanoel is what it used. Metanoel. What's the root of that? Meta. Meta, what does meta mean? Change, right? Metamorphosis, to change. Meta noel, noel means mind or a way of thinking. He's saying you've got to change your way of thinking. You've got to change your direction. You've got to change, you've got to repent. Hallelujah, Lord, what I need here today is a repentance. Yes. I need a change. I need a change. There are people that have come to church for years. I've sat on these chairs, on these pews for years across this nation and, and across the, the pond, so to speak, that, that have sat on church pews for years. And they have many experiences with God. I'm not taking away from those experiences. But they are still the same hateful, spiteful, bitter, angry, depressed. Come on. It doesn't just have to be sin. It can be something ungodly. Depressed. Depression. Anxiety. Fear. And they're the same individual they did for years. Why? They have, they have plenty of experiences with God. But they did not have a life changing experience. Hallelujah. I know that this service right now perhaps it's a little different than what you would expect. But even here today, well, this is now today, right now, God can change you. God can, do you believe that? God can change you. You say, well, I have a problem with this. I've always had a problem with it. This is who I am. This is my nature. Well, we just read in the book of Acts, God can change your nature. God can change your character. He changed Paul from being a, a violent, cruel man who breathed out threatenings and slaughter to being that loving man that preached on grace and forgiveness and neither Jew nor Greek. And, and come on, that, that, that was the very same one. Just changed. Changed. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me here today? I want us to sing a song and while we do a song, change me, Lord, change me, Lord. If we can find a place to pray. 
whether it be around this altar. In fact, if you're uncomfortable with that, if you've never come up and, and knelt at an altar, I encourage you to do just that. We're changing. We're changing. That means that if we've always done one thing, let's do something different. If we've always sat back in our chair, let's say, God, I'm ready for a change. I'm ready for a change. And I, I'm showing you that I'm ready for a change by making a change of my own right now. I'm willing to walk up. I'm willing to fall on my knees and say, God, I need a change in the day. I need something to happen in my life. Hallelujah. I need something to happen here today, God. I don't want to leave the same way that I came. I don't want to leave struggling with the same issues. I don't want to leave fighting the same things over and over and over and over. But God, I need a change. I'm desperate for a change. I'm desperate for a move here today. Hallelujah. I don't know who God was talking to today. I, I don't know who you are or where you're from. But God wants to change you. Hallelujah. Let God make you the man he wants you to be. Let God make you the husband, the father, the mother, the, the daughter that he wants you to be. Change me. Change me. Hallelujah. Let me be like the clay in the hands of the potter. Let me be like the like the like the painting in the hand of the master. Lord, shape me and change me and mold me. And let me be the, the creation that you intended me to be. Hallelujah, God. I thank you for what you're doing right now. I thank you, God, for the miracles you're working right now. In the name of Jesus. 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 Hallelujah. Change me, Lord. Change me, Lord. Change me, Lord. Hallelujah.